Good morning. I think uh, it's about nine o'clock, so okay. let's get started. Uh, as you know by now, the Center for Anabaptist Studies has cooperated with the U.S. Mennonite Brethren Church, uh, Center for Men uh, Anabaptist Studies at Fresno Pacific Seminary, and uh, with the USMB Church to offer periodic uh, webinars that approach issues of importance to the church. I'm very grateful for the work that now Janae Rempel uh, is doing to help gather us. And uh, very grateful for you to be with us today. Thank you for coming. Uh, in a moment, we'll ask uh, Terry Hunt to lead us in prayer, but let me introduce the people that on my screen are right beside me. Uh, Dina Gonzalez Pina and Darren Dirksen are going to be leaders throughout this four week, the four time series, monthly series. Uh, Dina, formerly worked with Fresno Pacific, but now works for Mennonite Central Committee, and her responsibility has to do with uh, justice in race relations. And so very grateful for her. She also pastors uh, the Mennonite Brethren Church in Hanford with her husband, Javier. Uh, Darren has experience as a missionary with Mennonite Brethren in India. Uh, his PhD is from Fuller, also in the area of intercultural relations, which is what he, I'm probably butchering that completely, Darren, intercultural communication and relations, and uh, that is his field at Fresno Pacific. So thank you, both of you, for giving that leadership. And uh, though I don't yet see your face, uh, Terry, would you please lead us in prayer, and we'll go straight into uh, the session that we have. It looks like he probably hasn't signed on quite yet. So let's. Uh, All right, let's... Dina, do you know how to pray? Why don't you lead us in prayer? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Lord, thank you for just the opportunity across our nation to use technology to, to encounter, address, learn together as the family of God. I thank you that each one of us come to this space, Lord, just you at the center of our lives. And in that search for you, we find each other and, and we, we dig into issues that are not easy, but that are at the heart of who you are as well. Lord, I pray that you give open our hearts, our minds, and that your spirit guide us, Lord, throughout these next couple of webinars as we uh, dig into the issues of race and power and, and all the ways in which our nation um, has, has done some of the historical spaces of injustice and how we as a church can now enter into the space as, um, as the work of justice and the work of Shalom. Thank you, Lord. May your presence be felt across our webinars today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, Darren and I have been teaching a couple of classes here the last couple of years at Fresno Pacific University, and we've done this series um, in class, and we've also done it with the university a couple years back. Some folks on today's webinar remember that, and it was quite helpful to for us to have a common language. I think sometimes when we enter difficult spaces, we come at this from different spaces, different understanding, different social constructs, and so what we are posing today and the next couple of months is that as the faith family that we start with common language we build that together what does it mean what do we understand how do we address this and uh, when we first started working on these uh, on addressing these issues it was the, the the faith community hadn't quite yet developed all of the ways to address this and so uh, we found a series called uh, race the power of an illusion that uh, was done by the Ford Foundation, PBS put this out, and we, it's a little dated now, so I just want us to bear with us, but it has some really powerful ways of talking about history and race in the U.S. context, and that's where we all are today. And so what we've, we've done is we, we're, we're, we're uh, rolling this out, and we're saying there's a three-part series to the conversation of race put together by, by this particular um, community but we also know that we are a faith community so it's not just about learning the historical context and the science and all of the ways we come at this also from a space of our faith 
of our foundation of Christ. And so there is a, another resource that we will invite you to as well to dig into because we, we need that balance. We need to make sure that, um, that we dig deeper into scripture about how we understand the context that we are in today in the US. And so um, today I just wanna invite us, this is a journey. Some of us are a little bit further down the path. Some of us are a little bit, have really not understood what this journey is about. So this is an invitation for all of us on today's webinar and the next couple of sessions as well to, to not just come at this from a space of resistance or, uh, but a space of like, what do I know? What don't I know? How am I going to learn this? How am I going to, what's the posture that I want to, and, and then who, who do I want to learn this with? And I thought this is a great bunch to learn something with, right? This is really, again, the faith and be faith family to learn and to dig into some of these things with. And so I just want us to, to look at ourselves and to ask the Holy Spirit. We want to come into a posture where the Spirit guides us, where we wrestle with this together as a faith family and, and where we come at this. Um, with questions, even more than answers. It's not about answers, it's about questions. Where and how and where do I do my further learning? The journey is a long journey. I'll tell you that right now. For folks who you know feel like, okay, we found the answer. Yeah, you probably have the wrong answer. This is a long journey. And it's been a long journey for our brothers and sisters of color who can trace their heritage back for generations and who've suffered oppression. It has been a long, long journey. And how do we understand what they've experienced generationally in terms of all laws and wealth and all the ways in which there's been some disparities between one groups and the other. So again, I come at this place and ask that we do this together. And I, I'm really encouraged by the work that's already been done by the USMB family. Um, the statement that was put out um, earlier in this in the summer um, on regarding racism is, is powerful. It's very powerful. And I just want to say in part of what they laid out as forward, looking forward, number three on the statement of uh, on race, it says we must be willing to be open-minded about where and how racism affects those who are not influenced, and especially, oh, sorry, who are not like us and where it is part of our own daily lives. That's what we've stated and that's what the invitation for today. We must take action within our own sphere of influence, especially where we live, where we work, and where we serve. That is today's posture for all of us as we live into this piece. So Dr. Dirksen, Dr. Darren, help us. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, for my part, again, just to say it, it is definitely an honor uh, and humbling to be a part of this. I, I lean on people like Dina to be my guides. I like the, the way she describes this. It's definitely a journey. It's been a journey for me and the journey continues as, as a white guy that grew up in Reedley and has been in different places, still living now in the Central Valley. Um, I, I've learned a lot and I have a lot more to learn. And maybe uh, many of you can kind of relate to this. Um, that this idea of a journey is, is something that hopefully keeps us humble and keeps us learning, keeps us hungry to do better. And I think if anything, these events over the last few months have told us uh, we can do things better. You know, and there's a lot of opinions about how we do things better, uh, but we can do things better. Now, as we were designing this series, uh, as Dina mentioned, we, we felt like what we want to do is just go back to the first principles and really ask a very basic question. What is this thing we call race? Now, it's such a basic question. And yet, if you ask 10 different people to answer it, you're probably going to get eight to 10 different answers. Um, and with that being the case, it's actually amazing that we think that we can have a discussion on race and race issues in this country or in our churches without knowing exactly what we're talking about. So what we're hoping in this webinar is that we, like Dina said, we're going to get some common understanding and some common language about what race is and what it isn't, how it's developed in our country and how it impacts us. So just in brief, uh, the, the first three sessions of our series today, October 6th, November 4th is going to be following this, this three-part webinar, uh, this three-part PBS series that uh, 
Dean has talked uh, told us about. Uh, so part one today, it's called the difference between us. And it's really a focus on the question of how uh, biology uh, does or does not impact what race is. So we're going to explore that. Part two, which happens on October 6th, is entitled The Story We Tell. That one goes, uh, that, this one's going to go into history and look at how the idea of race developed in our country from the founding of it um, on up into the 20th century. And then part three, which will be on November 3rd, is called The House We Live In. And in that session, we're going to take it up from 20th century, throughout the 20th century to the present. How has race and some of the ideas of race shaped uh, society, community, some of the policy here in the U.S., and, uh, and our relationships uh, between different uh, so-called racial and ethnic groups. So that's the, uh, that's the overall. Oh, and then uh, on December uh, 1st, or sorry, December 4th, we're going to have a, the fourth and final part of our webinar, and we're going to be looking at some other aspects of the doctrine of discovery, uh, kind of this core ideology, and again, how that sort of impacted the way in which race developed in this country. Okay, now in each session, uh, starting today, we're going to begin with some quick announcements like we're doing now, and then we're going to watch the, uh, the video all together, and we're going to play that right here over Zoom, so you don't have to go anywhere. Um, that will last about an hour, and so we'll watch that all together. As soon as that's done, we're going to break up into small groups. And, uh, and we're going to go ahead and decide those for you. So we'll, we'll put that and all you need to do is click on a button and that's going to take you straight to a small group where you're going to join about eight or nine other people together with a small group facilitator. And we got some great facilitators uh, who are prepared, ready to guide us in some discussions about the things we've seen, what we think about it, how it impacts us, those kinds of things. So after about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, we'll then come back for a final few minutes here in this space uh, where we'll wrap up, just make a couple of announcements, and we'll be done by 11 o'clock. So that's the way our sessions are going to go each time, uh, again, uh, including today. But first, before we go into the video, just one more quick uh, look ahead at uh, what Dina told us about with regards to a book study. So Dina, you want to tell sure. us a little more about that? Sure. So I, I, I'd like for you to just write this down. This is a book uh, called The Myth of Equality, Uncovering the Roots of Injustice and Privilege. Um, please order it for yourself, order it for your group if you have a church group coming um, and, and participate in the webinar. This is the, the journey of a pastor who, um, who was kind of really confronted with some of these questions and had, had these own uh, challenges. And um, in his journey, he begins to write down like, where are the spaces of discovery? Where are the scriptures? Where is the work that needs to be done, especially by our dominant communities, our, our white Anglo brothers and sisters? And so this is, we will be hosting uh, discussions on this book. Uh, Nate Yoder, who is now with, um, with uh, MB uh, Foundation, will be joining us for a discussion. So every, the two weeks after we do the webinars, we'll go for, for example, 5th, April 15th, our part one, the story of race, October 13th. Um, equality in the kingdom of God, uh, November 17th, the challenge of privilege, and then eventually uh, December 15th will be just quite Q and A's around all of this. And so we're going to, this will be the text that we use to deepen our faith entity in understanding race racism. And um, I've had this book for a couple of years now, picked it up in a, in a um, evangelical faith gathering nationally. And it's just been a, such a helpful way of understanding this very difficult issue. So I invite us into that space for us to do. Um, also, so we, we do have a chat here and specifically let's use that when we go into our small group discussion, please feel free to do that. But if you post the question in the chat and we don't get to it, we will try to get back there and I will try to get back to, to that and, and either get back to you or try to address it even as we do the webinars um, throughout the fall. So feel free to use the chat to post some questions. Um, I think that is it on my end. So. Great, we're about ready to start in. Uh, maybe one more just practical reminder. Uh, you all seem pretty good with Zoom. 
And um, in particular, you all have uh, your mutes on, which is great. Um, and so you're, you're kind of up on the, the, the Zoom etiquette here. Please continue to do that. Keep your uh, mutes, keep your mics muted. And, um, and uh, we will, again, address any questions that you have or try to via chat. Um, before we start the video, one thing is um, that uh, what we want to do is just take a minute and um, ask you to just reflect on a question. And the way we're going to do this is, again, I'm just going to give a minute of silence. And if you've got a pen and pencil in front of you, you could jot this down there. If you want to jot it on the computer right in front of you, go ahead and do that. The questions are these. It's two questions. Number one, how would you define race? And number two, where do you think your ideas about race come from? So number one, how would you define race? I could put these in the chat as well if you want to see them there. Number one, how do you define race? And number two, where do you think your ideas about race come from? Jot those down to yourself for a minute. And then uh, after a minute, we're going to go ahead and start the video. Major funding for this program provided by the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide. And the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding provided by these funders. question that individual human beings are different, one from the other. Our eyes confirm this day in and day out. Skin color, body shape, hair form, eye shape. For several hundred years, we have used these visual differences to classify people into four or five groups we call races. We have a notion of race as being divisions among people that are deep, that are essential, that are somehow biological or even genetic, and that are unchanging, that these are clear-cut, distinct categories of people. And the beauty of the race business is that you can identify people by just looking at them. You don't even have to look at their genes because one manifestation of their genes is there, namely skin color or eye shape or hair shape, and then that's the key to everything. The idea of race assumes that simple external differences rooted in biology 
are linked to other more complex internal differences, like athletic ability, musical aptitude, intelligence. This belief is based on the idea that race is biologically real. All of our genetics now is telling us that that's not the case. We can't find any genetic markers that are in everybody of a particular race and in nobody of some other race. We can't find any genetic markers that define race. And actually, what we're going to generate are billions of copies of a little section of your, of your genetic code. And we're going to look These at students are gathering for a DNA workshop led by Cold Spring Harbor Labs teacher Scott Bronson. Marcus, Gorgeous, Jackie, Noah, Hannah, Jamil, and their fellow students are about to explore the biology of human variation. But there's another type of DNA. Does anybody know what that type of DNA is? Yeah. Mitochondrial? Mitochondrial DNA. Very good. They will compare their skin colors. They're like not human colors. <laughs> they will type their blood. And they will swab cells from inside their mouths to extract a small portion of their own DNA. Once the sample is ready, they will compare some of their genetic similarities and differences. We're going to look at a very tiny section of this ring. The students begin the workshop with the same assumptions most of us have. As you begin to look at the data, you might want to keep in your mind who you think you might be most similar to and who you think you might be most different to. I think I probably have the most similarities with uh, Mr. Bronson or with Carol because we were white males, both Carol and I and both Scott Bronson and I. I think I'd have the most differences with Carol and the most similarities with Gorgeous. She's African-American, I'm African-American. I mean, like, black. I think maybe me and Natalia are most alike. She's Latin American and I'm Latin American. I figured that there would be tons of differences, especially with people who looked so different. To understand why the idea of race is a biological myth requires a major paradigm shift an absolute paradigm shift, a shift in perspective. And for me, it's like seeing, you know, what it must have been like to understand that the world isn't flat. And perhaps I can invite you to a mountaintop and you can look out the window and at the horizon and see, oh, what I thought was flat, I can see a curve in now that the world is much more complicated. In fact, that race is not based on biology, but race is rather an idea that we ascribe to biology. The idea of race as biology is ferociously persistent on America's playing fields. Gorgeous Harper and her teammates are competing at the Adidas Nationals. I love to run track. I've been running track since I was eight years old. The people I train with, they all want to be the best, and you got to put in the hard work. This is the top event for elite high school track and field stars. And while racial differences are not necessarily discussed openly, they are often part of the careful calculation of competitive edge. Well, I've heard some rumors I've heard are just like, blacks have an extra muscle in their leg, but I don't think anything's true. I assume that a white girl can't beat me in the 200. In my mind, I don't think she can beat me, but I won't, I won't sleep on her. I don't want to get too controversial here since I really don't know exactly, but I'd say that there's maybe a little bit that, not to use as an excuse as why they beat me sometimes, but maybe considering when you, when you look at the Olympics, you know, who, who tends to dominate the 100, the 200, and the quarter, for the most part. I just have to say the way it all falls out tends to point to what your race is. I'm really saying that 
different populations, whether it's West African descended blacks, and that's what African Americans trace their ancestry to West Africa, or East Africans, or whites or Asians, they all have different body types and different physiological structures that allow them to have advantages in one sport or another. There are as a genetic basis for these kinds of differences. Through uh, culture, environment, training, athletes can't dramatically change the limits of what they can be. I would like to say to John, there is no scientific definition that holds up about race. Race has changed this definition in this country to the benefit of those who wanted to define it differently. And there is no scientific place to start from, so you have no basis for your work. We can see differences among populations, but can populations be bundled into what we call races? How many races would there be? Five? Fifty-five? Who decides? And how different would they really be from one another? The measured amount of genetic variation in the human population is extremely small. And that's something that, that people need to wrap themselves around, that genetically we really aren't very different. In fact, genetically, we are among the most similar of all species. Only one out of every thousand nucleotides that make up our genetic code is different, one individual from another. These look-alike penguins have twice the amount of genetic difference, one from the other, than humans. And these fruit flies? Ten times more difference. Any two fruit flies may be as different genetically from each other as a human is from a chimpanzee. So the central question for us is, of the small amount of variation between us, what, if any, is mapped along what we think of as racial lines. Because we live in a racialized society, this is not an academic question. We have a long history of searching for racial differences and attributing performance and behavior to them. For 200 years, scientists poked and prodded, measured and mapped the human body, searching for a biological basis to race. Some measured facial angle to illustrate the proximity of races to the primitive. Others calibrated skull size to identify those with superior or inferior intelligence. Measures of eye shape, hair form, even brain color were scrutinized in the hunt for the fundamental sources of racial difference. If we just take African Americans as an example, there's not a single body part that hasn't been subjected to this kind of analysis. You'll find articles in the medical literature about the Negro ear, and the Negro nose, and the Negro leg, and the Negro heart, and the Negro eye, and the Negro foot, and it's every single body part. And they're constantly looking for some organ that might be so fundamentally different in size and character that you can say this is something specific to the Negro versus whites and other groups. Scientists are part of their social context. Their ideas about what race is are not simply scientific ones, are not simply driven by the data that they are working with. That is also informed by the societies in which they live. 
At the turn of the 20th century, American society was riding a wave of confidence as an emerging industrial power. And the face of its power and prosperity was white. African Americans lived under the yoke of Jim Crow segregation. Most surviving Native Americans had been banished to reservations and new immigrants crowded into urban ghettos. Disease was rampant, death rates soared, infant mortality was high. To many, this reflected a preordained natural order. Those that looked wanted to confirm what they saw, which is to say that the proper place of, say, the Negro, or in other regions of the country, the Native American, or the Chinese, were at the bottom of the, the social and political hierarchy. And if you can say that they are fundamentally, biologically different, then they should be. Then it's natural for them to be at the bottom of our social hierarchy. The biology becomes an excuse for social differences. The social differences become naturalized in biology. It's not that our institutions cause differences in infant mortality. It's that there really are biological differences between the races. For Prudential Life Insurance statistician Frederick Hoffman, those differences could lead to only one fate for African Americans. In Vital Capacity, he wrote, the tendency of the Negro race has been downward. This tendency must lead to a still greater mortality and in the end cause the extinction of the race. Hoffman's Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro was published in 1896, the same year the Supreme Court legalized segregation. It was one of the most influential publications of its day. What's interesting is that it resonated in the minds of so many other social observers of the time, the extinction thesis. It, it fit into their notions of how uh, races become ascendant in the world. They looked at other groups of people in various stages beneath them as approaching the completely civilized stage. Hoffman presented his statistical data as unimpeachable science. He compared rates of death and disease between African Americans and whites, and not surprisingly, found enormous disparities. But his data analysis was flawed. He ignored the insidious effects of poverty and social neglect on health. In contrast to today's belief in black physical superiority, Hoffman concluded that African Americans were innately infirm. As such, attempts to improve their housing, health and education would be futile. Their extinction was inevitable, encoded in their blood. By the 1920s, a single drop of blood reflecting African ancestry could identify any individual as black and inferior in every way. In the not-so-distant past, many of these students would have been considered contaminants were they to have bred into the superior white race. 28 states passed laws forbidding intermarriage to safeguard white racial purity. Racial purification was one aim of the eugenics movement the science of eugenics rested on simple Mendelian genetics. One gene each from father and mother, it was believed, gave rise to any trait, physical, behavioral, even moral. Some of these things were things like the ability to play chess, rowdiness, congenital feeble-mindedness, um, uh, virtually any cultural or behavioral trait you could imagine. Now, the mistake that they were making was assuming that complex behaviors could re be reduced to simple Mendelian genes. Nonetheless, eugenicists used the science of the day to advance a social agenda widely accepted in white America. 
to breed the best and the brightest, always white, and breed out society's worst and weakest, of all colors. There's a lot of concern about race mixing. You don't want a superior race, a race with great qualities of intellect and achievement and musical genius and these kinds of things to mix with a race on a lower stage of civilization that has fewer of these characteristics because that again would bring down the level of those characteristics and what you want to have for your civilization. What you did not want for your civilization was found in the Blue Hills of Virginia. Mongrel Virginians, mixed race, unclassifiable, and worse, able to pass for white, circumvent segregation laws, and breed into the white race. They were called the Wind Tribe for their white, Indian, and Negro ancestry. A combination of the worst racial traits, a badly put together people, said Charles Davenport, leader of the American eugenics movement. To keep America's mongrels at bay, eugenicists proposed a series of restrictive measures unthinkable today. Yet they were adopted within and outside of America. Taken to their extreme, they fueled one of the century's greatest horrors. The Nazi propaganda machine pointed out that their eugenic policies were entirely consistent and in fact derived from ideas of American race scientists. At the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, Hitler's Aryan race was to have confirmed its place at the top of nature's hierarchy. But the star of the games would shatter those expectations. And the games are on. Here in the semi-final heat of the 100-meter dash, Movie Tones camera catches the blinding speed of Jesse Owens, cracking the world record in the incredible time of 10 and 2 tenths seconds. As a child, Jesse Owens had been chronically ill, destined, it seemed, to fulfill Hoffman's extinction thesis until a teacher intervened. When he first asked me to go out for the track team in fifth grade, Owens wrote in his autobiography, it wasn't because he saw any potential champion in me. It was because he saw a potential corpse. Owens is ahead. Stunned by and burst while fighting. Ozendorf challenges Wyckoff. Owens wins in 10.3. Second, Metcalfe America. How could a society steeped in the science of racial inferiority reconcile itself to Owens' four gold medals? by conceding innate athletic superiority to African Americans while denying them so-called civilized capacities. In the words of American team coach Dean Cromwell, the Negro athlete excelled because he was closer to the primitive. It was not so long ago that his ability to sprint and jump was a life and death matter to him in the jungle. star of the squad goes the laurel of a champion. The competition was grand, and we're very glad to come out on top. Thank you very kindly. A flurry of debate between racial scientists and those contesting their assumptions greeted Owen's accomplishments. With the rise of the great Negro athletes in the 1930s, it became this question that there must be a reason that they're great and that that reason must reside in biology rather than in, in culture or history or circumstance. And Jesse Owens was picked apart. when the African-American anthropologist and physician Montague Cobb is trying to explain why Jesse Owens was such an outstanding track star, he does so by talking about his body. He talks about his feet. He talks about his legs, his calves, his chest capacity. And he comes to the conclusion, of course, that you know you can't say that Negroes have some special characteristics that make them more fit as runners. Among the few who challenge racial science, Cobb wrote, 
There is not one single physical feature, including skin color, which all our Negro champions have in common, which would identify them as Negro. But what marker would identify them as Negro in the first place? Jackie is Asian. Noah as white. Gorgeous as black. Think about race and its universality. Where is your measurement device? There is no way to measure race. We sometimes do it by skin color. Other people may do it by hair texture. Other people may have the dividing lines different in terms of skin color. What is black in the United States is not what's black in Brazil or what's black in South Africa. Can't be atoned for previous failures at the plate with that one. My favorite trivia question in baseball is which Italian-American player for the Brooklyn Dodgers once hit 40 home runs in a season. No one ever gets it right because the answer is Roy Campanella who is as Italian as he was black. He had an Italian father and a black mother. He's always classified as black. You see, American racial classification is totally cultural. Who's Tiger Woods? Who's Colin Powell? Colin Powell's as Irish as he is African. Being black has been defined as just looking dark enough that anyone can see you are. When I was a child, one of the things my father bought me was a set of Time Life books on science. And a book on evolution had in it a skin color scale that went from 1 to 36. And I would spend hours putting my arm against the scale in the book, the picture in the book, trying to figure out what number my color was. And I couldn't quite find myself on the scale. You can be either 19 or 20. Who would be this color? I'm not saying mate. I'm not 13. I wonder if it matters how tan you are. Not 14. Not 14. You're too pink. I'd say that John and Noah, both white by appearance, and Jackie and I both fit under the Asian classification. But I guess the thing that surprised me was with the skin color test, you know, what should you technically call the entire group? I would never know that all our, all our skin colors are so similar. Exactly, like we match. Should you call them all white? Or should you call them 11 to 15? <laughs> you know? Wow, maybe lighter than those. I'm white. Would I trade my skin color? No. no. Get back. <laughs> um. I probably wouldn't trade my skin color. It's something that I've taken for granted. It's also a privilege, I guess. I think 13 is closer. 13 is closer. Wow. We're like all 13. I know. There's no profit in denying it that, um, that there is a certain advantage to being white. Wow, I'm being negative. Yeah, I'm like. We all have the same 35,000 or so genes, but over time, mutations cause variations in our DNA. Today, some genes, like those for skin color, come in different forms. In a few genes that control the colors of melanin in our skin, different alleles, different mutations occurred that were positively selected so that many of us with very light skin, lost the capacity to make dark melanin. Dark melanin blocks out some ultraviolet light and is found where sunlight is intense. Lighter melanin is found where sunlight is less intense. Scientists debate why this is. One hypothesis is that it happened because sunlight is essential to have adequate vitamin D. In northern latitudes, with very little light during the winter, one needed every bit of light that one could capture in order to be able to have adequate, active vitamin D. And children in particular would need to have, would need to be able to absorb into their skin enough light to have vitamin D present to keep them healthy. 
The best way to understand the genetic differences that we find in human populations is that populations differ by distance. And it's a continuous change um, from one group to another. And one way we can look at this is use the example of skin color. If we were to only look at people in the tropics and people in Norway, we'd come to the conclusion that there's a group of people who have light skin, there's a group of people who have dark skin. But if we were to walk from the tropics to Norway, what we would see is a continuous change in skin tone. And at no point along that trip would we be able to say, oh, this is the place in which we go from the dark race to the light race. Human biological variation is so complex. There are so many aspects of human variation. So there are many, many ways to begin to explain them. Variation in some traits, like eye shape, hair texture, whether or not your tongue curls <laughs> involves very few genes. And even those genes haven't all been identified. Variation in traits we regard as socially important is much more complicated. Differences in how our brains work, how we make art, how gracefully we move. Genes may contribute to variation in these traits, but to the extent they do, there would be a cascade of genes at work, interacting with each other and the environment in relationships so intricate and complex that science has hardly begun to decipher them. People are always talking about genes for things. The genes for athletic ability, the genes for making money, the genes for intelligence. And you have to be very careful, even when there are genes that influence those things, to talk about it as genes for them, it's not so clear. What makes us different is both those genetic differences that we have between us, and also the interaction of that genome with the environment and the environment is a very, very complicated thing. So when I say, I sort of mean the environment writ large, everything from the environment in the womb to the environment in your school. Now the stars fight a path through the Celtic defense. In the urban environment of the 1930s, Jewish teams dominated American basketball. But Castleman shoots from outside, and it's good. Sons of immigrants. Theirs were the hoop dreams of the day. And they rush it up the floor, and the spas win. And it was said that the reason that they were so good at basketball was because the, the artful dodger characteristic of the Jewish culture made them good at this sport. There are strong cultural aspects of what sports individuals choose to play. It has to do with the interaction of individual genetic background, of opportunity and training. History shows us that as opportunities change in society, different groups get drawn into sporting arenas. By 1992, America's Olympic dream team was almost completely African-American. Ten years later, 20% of NBA starters would be foreign-born. The top NBA draft pick, Chinese. We can't come to any fast, hard rule about how uh, genetic ancestry is going to influence the ability of an individual to perform an athletic event. So I don't think we're ever going to be able to isolate a gene for athletic performance. or a gene for any complex trait. If genes contribute to Marcus's musical talent, there would be dozens interacting with environment, training, 
and practice. Those genes would be inherited independently of the genes for eye shape, skin color, and hair form, which Marcus inherited through his Korean and Jamaican ancestors. For race to be more than skin deep, one has to have concordance. In other words, skin color needs to reflect things that are deeper in the body under the skin. But most of human variation is non-concordant. Skin color or eye color or hair color is not correlated with height or weight. And they're definitely not correlated with more complex traits like intelligence or athletic performance. person you said was going to be most similar to me, right? Yeah. What's his number? He's 34. The tools of modern genetics allow the students to explore the idea of race and concordance. <laughs> From the beginning, they believed they would be most similar genetically to those whose racial ancestry they believed they shared. Okay. Who would you say was going to be most different? No, but he's nine. nine. They have now sequenced a small loop of their mitochondrial DNA. If we want a very fine scale for assessing how similar we are to each other, person by person, we can do that by sequencing that small bit of mitochondrial DNA. mtDNA is a second set of DNA found in the cell's mitochondria. It does not code for any traits and is inherited only from our mother. Now, what will it tell us? It will tell us a whole lot about one of our ancestors, our mother's 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 mother. Ooh. Wow. Seems like everyone has blood. The student's mtDNA appears as the letters A, C, T, and G, representing the four nucleotides that define our DNA. The students are sampling a small sequence, about 350 letters long. They find that most of it is identical, one to the other. What is not is highlighted in yellow. Six, seven, eight, 12. <laughs> 12. Well, a lot of differences with everybody. Because I'm different. I'm, I'm really different. <laughs> Jamil thought he'd have the fewest MT DNA differences with Gorgeous. But I was more like Kiro than I was than Gorgeous. She has like 12 differences, and like Kiro is, is like a white, his, his hips background. So yeah, he's like from Russia. And, and the, like we, we seem completely different, but it's less differences. But I mean, it's hard to tell because we don't. I mean, with John thought he'd have the fewest differences with Kiro and with Noah. In fact, John discovered that he had the same number of differences with Kirill as he had with Jackie. Only three. Okay, one, two, three. That's not bad. I don't think mine is going to show up close with anybody. If human variation were to map along racial lines, people in one so-called race would be more similar to each other than to those in another so-called race. That's not what the students found in their mtDNA. What about other genetic differences? The problem for evolutionists and population geneticists was always to try to actually characterize how much genetic variation there was between individuals and groups. And I spent a lot of time worrying about that, like other people in my profession. In the 1960s, Richard Lewington decided to find out just how much genetic variation fell within and how much between the groups we regard as races. A new technology enabled him to do pioneering work. And that method, which is called gel electrophoresis, a very fancy name, um, we were able to use on any organism at all. If you could grind it up, you could do it. Uh, that included people. I mean, you don't have to grind the whole person, but you could take a little bit of tissue or blood. Over the years, a lot of data were gathered by anthropologists and geneticists looking at blood group genes and protein genes and other kinds of genes from all over the world. I mean, anthropologists just went around taking blood out of everybody. Uh, 
Uh, I, I must say, if I were a South American uh, Indian, I wouldn't have let them take my blood, but, uh, but they did. And so I thought, well, we've got enough of these data. Let's see what it tells us about the differences between human groups. Lewinton's findings were a milestone in the study of race and biology. If you put it all together, and we've now got that for proteins, for blood groups, and now with uh, DNA sequencing, we have it for DNA sequence differences, it always comes out the same. 85% of all the variation among human beings is between any two individuals within any local population, between individuals within Sweden or within uh, the Chinese or the Kukuyu or the Icelanders. To put it another way, of the small amount of variation in our genes, there is apt to be as much difference between Gorgeous and her teammate Christine as there is between Gorgeous and her opponent, Kaylin. Any two individuals within any so-called race may be as different from each other as they are from any individual in another so-called race. Are the people who we call black more like each other than they are like people who we call white, genetically speaking? Um, the answer is no. There's as much or more diversity and genetic difference within any racial group as there is between people of different racial groups. Still, we know that some genes are found with greater frequency in some populations. And geography is the better way to explain that more than race or anything else. There can be accumulations of genes in one place in the globe and not another like the gene forms regulating skin color. And for some genetic diseases, like sickle cell disease. Long assumed to be a racial trait, sickle cell disease is a debilitating disorder caused by a gene form that alters the shape of red blood cells. It's one of the misconceptions that sickle cell disease is an African-American or an African disease. Sickle cell trait is not uncommon in people, from the, in people from the Mediterranean region. In fact, in some parts of Greece, up to 30% of people in the population may carry sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait persists in certain populations around the world because of the relative resistance it confers to malaria. So people who've got sickle cell trait are less likely to develop malaria, and when they do develop it, they are less likely to develop severe complications and to die from it. Where malaria was common, the sickling gene was selected. In Arabia, South Asia, Central and Western, but not Southern Africa and in the Mediterranean Basin, the home of Jackie Washburn's ancestors. Thought to have originated only a few thousand years ago, sickle cell is not a racial trait. It's the result of having ancestors who lived in malarial regions. Race does not account for patterns of genetic variation. Our recency as a species, and the way we have moved and mated throughout our history, does. Our human lineage originated in Africa. About two million years ago, Small groups of early hominids, not modern humans, began a first migration out of Africa to the far reaches of the globe, breeding isolated lineages. It was long thought and is still believed by some that those first lineages led to genetically distinct races that are with us today. It turns out that's not true. I think there's almost 
genetic proof now, I wouldn't say the issue is totally resolved, that those lineages just died out, that Neanderthals in Europe died, that Homo erectus in Asia died, that there was a second migration of our modern species, Homo sapiens, and that all modern humans are products of the second migration, which is probably less than 100,000 years old by the best current evidence. Some of those movements may follow major migrations as agricultural people came into Europe, as people crossed the Bering Strait and came into the Americas. But other movements are much more subtle. They're smaller groups of individuals that moved or their genes moved from place to place and time to time. We've had maybe a hundred thousand years of having genes move out and mix and reassort in countless different ways. A hundred thousand years may seem like a long time, but in evolutionary terms, it is a blink of the eye. Human populations have not been isolated from each other long enough to evolve into separate subspecies. There just hasn't been time for the development of much genetic variation, except that which regulates some very superficial features like skin color and hair form. But once the old cliche is true, under the skin we really are effectively the same, and we get fooled because some of the visual differences are quite noticeable. The superficial traits we use to construct race are recent variations. By the time they arose, important and complicated traits like speech, abstract thinking, even physical prowess had already evolved. As geneticists, we now have the opportunity to investigate using proper genomic analysis, complex human traits, athletic ability, musical ability, intelligence, all these wonderful traits that we wish we understood better, and for which we'd very much like to know if there are genes that are involved, how they interact, how they play out. Those traits are old. We spent most of our history as a species together in Africa in small populations before anyone left. There's far more of us now than those small original populations that founded our species. Each of us carries with us some very recent variation and some common shared variation that goes way back in human history. Variations among us in those old traits, developed independent of and non-concordant with variations in the recent superficial traits we think of as racial. Human variation does not map onto what we call race no matter how we might measure it. So now it's going to this gigantic database of DNA. You're going to blast this database with your DNA sequence, and it's going to pull up anything that's significantly similar. And now the final exercise of the DNA workshop offered the students further evidence of the genetic variation within groups. They compared their mitochondrial DNA sequences with an international database. So the first choice for you is urban mitochondrial DNA. There's one, two, three... Gorgeous's sequence was most five. similar to that of a urban individual in Nigeria. That's the closest person. And that's what you were saying, that's the closest person that you've matched mm -hmm. up. Now, does that necessarily mean you're urban? <laughs> no. No. It just means that there's somebody in this part, whoever in this part of the world, has a very similar DNA sequence to you. And remember, if we look at other people within this urban group, I expect to see other forms of mitochondrial DNA. So let's close. And they did. Her match was dramatically different from another Eurobans whose DNA sequence was very different from still other Eurobans. Because modern humans first evolved in Africa, there is even greater genetic diversity in Africa than elsewhere. So if there were a catastrophe which destroyed the rest of the world's population, most of the genetic variability in the world would still be present in sub-Saharan Africa. Is that it? <laughs> yeah.
Genetic data can subvert racial assumptions about our ancestry. And so I'm going to compare your DNA sequence with somebody from a study that was done on a population uh, in the Balkans. We can see how many differences. We see one, two, two differences. Jackie's data search matched her with a sequence from an individual in the Balkans. So you're expecting something maybe more Japanese or something yes, like this? Yes, definitely more Japanese instead of Balkan. That's interesting. At all. If I actually know my maternal lineage, like I know where it should end up, doing a search like this should double check it, right? What's your preconceived notion? My preconceived notion is um, we know back through my great, great, great grandmother, and she had lived in Eastern Europe her whole life in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. OK. In a little town in Ukraine. Okay. As far as I understand. But remember, this little town in Ukraine may have many different mitochondrial uh, DNA yeah. sequences within it. So let's go back and we'll look at yours. And isolate from the Balkans. Not a major shock there. Uh, let's see how similar you are to that person. And we'd always guessed that my great grandmother had been this nice little farm girl who had spent her whole life in the Ukraine. And so I was pretty sure that. I should be a pretty exact match to one of those ethnic groups. And I was 100% match. So I'm going to compare you with someone uh, in Iceland. All right. We also pulled up a sequence from Iceland. OK. Mm. Wow. I see no wow. differences. Yeah, again, this, uh -huh. And that one. Mm. So what does that tell you? So are you Icelandic or are you Balkan? Huh. Or what does it tell us? And we pulled up a third Same. sequence Same. from somewhere in Africa. And I was also a 100% match. Well, that's a 100% match. Wow. That's very significant. Um, and that's weird. Well, what it's showing you is not that you're closely related to this person, possibly mitochondrially speaking, and that uh, we're all very closely related. So, so that's somewhat shocked me, actually, that there were so many of these racial the groups that match. shared it. I'm just a mutt, so to speak. I've been crossbred and interbred with lots of different ethnic groups. Let's see if it gets more interesting than we think. I think the way to think about things is that we're all mongrels. We've always been mixing. Every single one of us is a mongrel. Let's see what else comes up. Today's genetic findings corroborate Richard Lowington's discoveries of 30 years ago. Because of our history of moving, mating, and mixing, most human variation, especially that of older, complex traits, can be found within any population. Most of it from a common source in Africa. We have now understood genetic variation in human beings. I'm not saying our knowledge is fixed for all time. It never is. But I think we have seen just how shallow and superficial the average differences are among human races, even though in certain features like skin color and hair form, the visual differences are fairly striking. They're based on almost nothing in terms of overall genetic variation. Racist biology simply doesn't work. But what is important is that race is a very salient social and historical concept, a social and historical idea. We live in racial smog. Just because race isn't something biological, that doesn't mean it's not real. There are a lot of things in our society that are real and are not biological. Race, as we understand it, as a social construct, has a lot to do with where somebody will live what schools they will go to, what jobs they will get, whether or not they will have health insurance. Black, white, and brown are merely skin colors. But we attach to them meanings and assumptions, even laws that create enduring social inequality. When I'm walking the streets alone at night, coming home from parties and stuff, I never get a sideways glance at people asking what I'm doing there. If a woman is stumbling with her shopping bags and I stop and say, would you like a hand? I never get sort of a glance with two meanings. It's always, oh, nice white boy, you can help. On my own campus, uh, when I walk to classes, students often come up to me and ask me if I'm the football coach or the basketball coach. And I tell them, no, I'm a professor in the Department of Life Sciences. It's easy to be white. It's very easy to be white. It's never been easy for Africans or African-Americans here, never. 
It's been a long, long time, you know, since the abolition of slavery, you know, African-American slavery in, in this country. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Those ideas are still around. No matter how they view themselves, the world sees Jackie, Gorgeous, and John as separate races. The social expectations that await them are in many ways dependent upon that racial assignment. Would our expectation about Gorgeous be that she is a champion athlete or valedictorian of her class? In fact, Gorgeous is both. But since the days of Jesse Owens, our society has more readily acknowledged and more avidly rewarded one of her talents over the other. If the playing field were level, the array of opportunities open to Gorgeous and her teammates would not be limited by assumptions society makes about the nature of the genes they inherited. Lots of things are inherited that don't have anything to do with genes. Money's inherited. And money goes a long way in increasing someone's capacity to do well in one area or another. Off the track, the playing field is not level. The net worth of the average white American family is eight times that of the average African American family. Race is a concept that was invented to categorize the perceived biological, social, and cultural differences between human groups. And the beauty of that ideology is that it justifies what is the greatest uh, social agony of American life. Namely, it justifies the inequalities that exist in a society which is said to be based on equality. Race is a human invention. We created it. We have used it in ways that have been, in many, many respects, quite negative and quite harmful. And we can think ourselves out of it. We made it, we can unmake it. The racialized society we live in has been under construction for three centuries. How can we unmake race unless we first confront its enormity? as a historical and social reality and its emptiness as biology. All right, all, well, welcome back. Uh, trust that you had some good conversations in your small group. What we wanna do now as we wrap up is a couple of different things. Number one, we're gonna give you an opportunity to uh, share uh, a little bit of your learnings if you want. And then after that, we'll uh, make just a couple of announcements as we uh, conclude our time and we'll have a word of prayer from, uh, from Pastor uh, Terry Hunt. Uh, but as we share, uh, we want to give you two ways to do that. Number one, one way that you could share with all of us right now, if you would like, is to type into chat, what is one highlight, one point of learning that was most important or that you think you'll take forward with, from, with you after this, uh, um, after this event. What is one highlight, one point of learning? If you wanna jot that down in chat, you can. And, um, and then we can even capture those and be part of the recording or we can uh, sort of uh, create a document and share that if we, if we wanna be able to have a record of what others are gathering out of this. Um, but secondly, I also want to just take a, a moment here and give an opportunity if one or two of you would like to share with the whole group one highlight or one thing that stands out to you, one point of learning that one of you wants to verbally share with us. So again, we'll just pause for a few moments here. Um, if you'd like to, just go ahead and unmute and, um, and share with us as a group. 
Uh, if you all know Zoom, you might have it on speaker view already, but if, if you want to put it on speaker view, that way you'd be ensured to see the person who is coming forward and talking. But let's just take a couple of minutes. If anyone wants to share a point of learning, go right ahead. All right, we're seeing a lot of good stuff coming through on the chat. That's excellent. Give you a few more moments to put things on chat if that's what you're wanting to do, or if someone wants to share with the group, give you just a couple more moments to do so. Mm. Uh, can I comment? Please. Uh, I, I found it helpful to clarify even further than it was already for me, uh, the difference between race and ethnicity. They're, they're just totally incongruent concepts. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Yeah, maybe that's something we can explore even further at some point, uh, Dina, is, is how those have developed in different ways. And probably our coming webinars will, again, not get specifically into ethnicity, but they'll further develop the way in which race as a concept has developed over our US history. Thank you, Gary. In our group, uh, Darren, um, only one person uh, said they had really considered or wished for a change in their skin color, not to change who they are inside, that was always solid, but this current context, it was noted too, uh, not just skin color, which is becoming a, a deadly difference between us, but also gender. And, um, and, and you know, I'm gonna say as a, as a white person to hear another white man say that if I was a female, I likely would have been sexually assaulted by now if I was uh, had darker skin color, I may well be dead. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, this idea of were we able to, would we change something about ourselves? I mean, that's a, that gets at some really core questions about identity and to what degree would we be willing to identify with somebody different than us and what would that mean what would we have to sacrifice and feel that we don't normally sacrifice and feel and those are deep and important questions to think about even if, even though it's just simply theoretical all right thanks for sharing uh both with the whole group verbally and those of you that have put things into the chat. We're gonna try and capture some of that and um, continue the conversation together. So just in summary, uh, today was focusing on a few important points. Let's just go ahead and state them uh, again in summary. Number one, uh, race is a modern idea uh, that is um, very much within our own history. We'll get at that even further in the coming weeks. Race has no genetic basis. That was a strong point of our video. Human subspecies don't exist. Skin color is really only skin deep. And then lastly, most variation is within, not between so-called races, which again, just kind of uh, debunks and deconstructs this whole idea of race. So as we go forward in the next few weeks, we'll, uh, we're, we'll look at and unpack this a little bit further. Uh, Dina, why don't you tell us some questions here that we could be thinking sure. about as we get towards next, next time. Yeah, so the end of the video today, we talked about we live in a racial smog or that racialized uh, has a social contract that's been under construction for three centuries. So as we lead into next month, the questions that we'll be addressing is, where are some ways that race has been used to rationalize inequality? I think that's an important question for us to ask. What are some ways that race has been used to rationalize inequality? And then how long do you think the idea of race has been around? 
where did it come from? Who curated it? How did it get used? Um, and then maybe even one of the ways we can even post the question is, do you think that Africans in the US were enslaved because they were deemed inferior or were they deemed inferior because they were enslaved? So even as we ask the questions, which, which where, where do we start? Where do we go with these pieces? Um, some, of the, some of the learnings that we'll encounter and engage next month. Um, again, just a reminder that the third Tuesday at during Pacific time, noon time, we'll start on this conversation on the book, The Myth of Equality. Um, I will be sending out a Zoom information, although I did put it in our chat just in case you are, were able to capture that, and I'll put it in again. But September 15th, a conversation around now the biblical lens as we look at the issues of race, equality, and the kingdom of God, the challenges of privilege, and then Q&A towards the end of that piece. And then our final session, our next session will be October 6th. Um, the story we tell, this is this has been very, a, very, a very helpful and insightful way of us entering a conversation. And this one specifically, like the story we tell, who created the story? Who has the power to create the narrative that we have now understood to be history? Um, it, it does a really fair job of drawing us and taking us into these spaces. So, so yeah, that's what we'll um, do together uh, next month. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, all of you as uh, group leaders, and especially thank you, uh, Darren and Dina, for giving leadership to the entire morning. Uh, thank you, Terry Hunt, for your support, and uh, Pastor Terry from the North Carolina, the district minister there, is with us now and is going to dismiss us in prayer. Anything else that we've forgotten? Looks like we're ready to go. Okay, Terry. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, in your name, to uh, reveal to us your plan and your strategy for the season that we're in right now. Thank you for uh, just giving us knowledge and wisdom of our history, whereby it will enable us to make better decisions as we move forward in our efforts to fight against racism and to uh, be able to create an, an, an environment where all people are created equal. Lord, just uh, continue to move our hearts with, um, with empathy and, uh, and, and fill it with grace and love as we continue to have conversations around this subject. And then God, we just asked uh, for your divine intervention because we can't change uh, our nation nor can we change um, uh, individuals, only you can do that. So we place our work in your hands and ask that you would use it in a way that only you can do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you all, uh, and we'll see you uh, at least a month from today, uh, the next first Tuesday of October. Bye. Go in peace. <laughs>